I am Brad Keeler, she is Suzanne Lacoste. Next up on Director's Cut, find out why she had to stay up all night before a two month trip to the North Sea. Hello again everybody and welcome to Director's Cut. My name is Brad Keeler, I'm the director of the Geo Institute and that is why we call this show Director's Cut. Every week, but this week, every day, I'm sitting down with a different GI member who has stories to tell about themselves. Some of them are personal, some are professional, but all of them are fun. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, after you watch this today, you should head over to geoinstitute.org and there you will find out we are a technical society with about 12,000 members, most of whom are geotechnical engineers and or geologists, and we are part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. The last thing I will implore you to do, plead with you to do, is if you like what you see today, and I think you will, you should click subscribe, you should click get notifications, and we will let you know every time we post something to the YouTube channel. All of that aside, you will see that again we are here in Austin, Texas, the site of the ISFOG conference this week hearing about all the latest advances in offshore geotechnics, and one of the attendees Geo legend Suzanne Lacasse, expert advisor at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, and we're thrilled to have her here with us this week, and we're thrilled to have you as a guest on Director's Cut, so thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> we are going to have a lot of fun, the same way we always do on Director's Cut. We have 10 questions. Two of them are the same as we ask everyone, and so we have to start with one of those. Describe your job in 45 seconds. Well, today, I guess my job is to convince clients of the goodness of NGI's research and NGI's solutions. I write a lot of research proposals, and I find that I coordinate many projects, many of them oriented on risk. And I guess the part I like most is I work on projects with the younger generation so that they can take my place. Which is important, yes. because if there was nobody behind you, <laughs> we wouldn't be doing a very good job fostering that pipeline. That, that is great. We also have a lot of fun questions when we come on Director's Cut, and we're going to get one of those right away. I always wonder about other people's preferences with this one, because uh, I do not talk to anybody when I'm on a plane. <laughs> I had a very unfortunate episode one time where I forgot my earbuds and it was a really long flight. So I have to ask you, do you talk to fellow passengers when you're on a plane or on a train and why or why not? Well, I don't wear ear earbuds, but I never, never engage a conversation on the plane. If someone asks a question, I will answer. But I always have something to do. I work or I do Sudoku or sleep, but no, I never walk, talk to a stranger on the plane. Did you ever have a bad experience with it oh. and that's why you did that or have you just always avoided it? No, that's not why I did it, but I have had bad experience, <laughs> especially women talking all the time. Yeah, that's especially if you're on a long plane ride, that is not, you, you know, you get an hour in and you think, I've got nine more hours to go. <laughs> Well, I just do as if I sleep. <laughs> or pretend to sleep. That's, yes. that's like a very good tactic. <laughs> so I always try to put in a research or a technical question for the person. You went a completely different direction than anyone ever has on Director's Cut. And I was so excited about this that I think that's, that's what we're going to do. The way you interpreted the question was, what research do you want to do that you've never been able to do? And this is great, so <laughs> tell the people. Well, I would like to do more research on landslide risk. I have a dream where we would uh, be able to predict the stability of a slope, and then we would measure, and we would interpret the measurement 
in real time, also using machine learning, and then interpret the measurement as a function of the model that we have in our prediction, and then have already prepared all the actions that can be done depending on the outcome of the prediction and the analysis, and also have already programmed what is a societal reaction, so that it's all in one package. And then there would be a system for each different types of landslide, like the rock slide, for the slides in, in uh, debris, debris flows, for example, or for even some quick clays and finding some methods of warning people about it. So it's the whole package, I think, would be a perfect solution for... So that's really good. What, I mean, obviously, we would have to get there incrementally. What do you think... Uh, of that kind of vision, what do you think is the most accessible part of that now? Or what's not, where are we not there yet? Is it the machine learning that needs to improve substantially or? No, I think we've done some good steps in machine learning. It's, it's still progressing, but the, there's a lot of promise there. I think it's the coordination and the communication that's still missing. And also bringing the public ab aboard so that they, they believe that, yes, there is a risk and we have to live with it, but we have to also be prepared for it. And so, so if we have a, naturally the system has to be made um, uh, attractive and easy to understand and all these calculation machine learning have to be hidden in the background. But uh, I think the, the, the most pressing thing to look at is Establishing these threshold of when does it become dangerous, when it yeah. is that you have to start warning, and then make sure that this warning goes to the public in time because there's always some time delays in the action. And that people alter their behavior depending right. on the warning they get. I think sometimes we forget about these kind of old fashioned problems, especially with hazards, and just getting out to people and getting them to do the right thing is sometimes the hardest part. Yeah, and also is that people are dynamic. Right. <laughs> so the risk changes all the time. If you get more people, then the risk is higher. So, so uh, there should be a way in this day and age with all the automatic system we have and the measurements that are available that we can make this completely automatic. So that's my dream. Oh, I like that though. And I'm glad that you interpreted that question that way because it was very exciting and that's a great answer. Until last year, at IFC 2021, where uh, Trish Culligan was the seed lecturer, and then this year with Ellen Rathje as the peck lecturer. Until that, you were the only woman to give one of GI's big three lectures, Terzaghi, Seed, and Peck. I mean, how did you have any feelings about them joining you in that club? But do you feel like we're making a lot of progress there, or like it's not coming quickly enough? Uh, just your thoughts on that. No, I, first, I am on the ACE Awards Committee, so I had a part in having them nominated or uh, selected. But um, I was very proud that Trish and Ellen were selected, and I was even prouder when I heard them give the lectures. Mm -hmm. They did such a good job. They were such good lecturers. So, so I think it's only a good thing. And the... F Okay, the, the reason I was alone is because I'm of a certain age. <laughs> it takes a while for the, uh, the women to have enough experience to be recognized in this way. Right. But I think it's completely a step in a new direction. And I'm always, always happy when there are women that are recognized by the SCE Awards. There will be more, I'm sure. And my public service announcement for this episode is that, you know, a lot of times the awardees are only as good as the nominations we get. So if you... <laughs> ever have an inkling viewers to nominate one of your colleagues who's deserving of an award please do so know that uh, Suzanne can tell you being on the awards committee all the nominations are taken very seriously and we love it when we have more nominations than we thought we were going to get we'll put a link below the video so that you can see all the awards deadlines and nominate your colleagues for a future one Another question I had to put in, I know you've spent a lot of time in Norway, and for those of you who have not been above about 45 degrees north, the farther north you go, obviously the more sun there is in the summer, and you don't really, I feel like anyway, you don't really understand it until you experience it. 
what is the craziest thing that you've done under the midnight sun <laughs> or the permanent twilight, as it were, <laughs> depending on how far up you are? Yeah, well, yeah, it, is, it is very light in the summer. And I had to think a long time to find out the craziest thing I had done. <laughs> I am not a risk-taking person, except for downhill skiing. There I do take risks, but that's experience. But, but the craziest thing I did, and it took the whole night, <laughs> the whole period, but it was, it was light. We were going off to the North Sea for a 60-day trip. And all of a sudden, we found we, it was the first time the X-ray equipment was going to be used offshore to X-ray the samples as soon as they come out mm -hmm. from the ground. And the plexiglass tube did not fit our machine. So I had to spend the whole night machining, <laughs> boring, a, going to a workshop and then machining this tube so that it would fit into our x-ray machine. So it was quite an experience. And then right away on the ship, I hadn't slept at all, but the x-ray machine worked at the end. But today, I always play it safe. <laughs> no more risk. So for a much more general question here, now that you've been that far north for such a long time, do you find that your your body's rhythms adjust to it, or is it always a little bit shocking when the days get really long every year? Oh no, no, it's it's I I love it when the days are long, and I certainly adapt when the days are very short. But remember, I'm born <laughs> further That's north. That's true. Than you. <laughs> so the days and we're going to talk about that in a little bit too. <laughs> in northern Quebec, but. Uh, now, I've always liked the change of season. In fact, my body reacts more when I am in countries where the whole day is 12 days darkness, 12 days oh. light. I don't like that as much as having the variation in the seasons. Variety is the spice of life, I think. <laughs> the other question that we ask everybody when they come on Director's Cut is how did you first get involved in ASCE and GI? <laughs> it's funny that you asked that and I reflected on that. And, well, I remember when I was a student at Ecole Polytechnique, my professors told me it's very important that you become a member and then you get involved in the, it was the Canadian Society and then the ASCE. And, and uh, I said, yes, I would do, but as everybody, it doesn't get done right away. And uh, when I turned 20 years old, <laughs> we, we were not very rich, <laughs> didn't have too much money to mm -hmm. pay for that. And uh, my brother and sister-in-law, they gave me as present my first year membership in the ASCE wow. in 1970. Now I'm a life member, <laughs> thanks to ASCE. But I thought that was one of the nicest presents I've ever got. And they gave me that and then a subscription to the journal. So, so that's how they did it. And they, f they formed my career because I am absolutely convinced that many of the advantages I've had, the recognition that I've had, is due to the membership in ASCE and the Canadian Geotechnical Journal and the British Society and such. I, I am completely convinced people know you more if you get involved. That is an amazing response. That's the first time I've heard that one too. We've heard some good ones, <laughs> but that one is really good. Follow-up that's not on there, what do you think is the I don't know, the most fun experience you've had, either because of ASCE or GI. Is there anything, maybe it's the Terzaghi lecture, but is there anything else that you've really enjoyed that you've been able to do because of GI or yeah, ASCE? The Terzaghi lecture is unique, so when everybody knows that, so we put yeah. that one aside. But, no, I think for me, it's every year, not the past three years because of the pandemic, right. but every year I come to the ASCE conference, or the GI conference, and I meet the friends, and we exchange, we find out what has happened the past year. We talk technical, we talk privately, we talk social things. And it's a real joy to come to the annual conference. So, so I would say to put the sum of things together, the, the, the journal is good and all that, but it's, it's meeting the people, uh, serving on some committees, uh, having some meetings for different things and sometimes we have uh, <laughs> there's a DG meeting yep. and uh, there's uh, elections and such so that annual repetition of the meeting yeah. is 
for me, that's the motivation factor. And it's exciting for us when people tell us that because I, I really want our members to think of Geo Congress as the family reunion every year and where they can do that's, exactly like a, what you just said. The family reunion, that's the right thing. And I, I experienced that with the ASE conference. I experienced that with the Canadian Geotechnical too. Because nobody goes home Maybe this is sad, depending on who you are. Nobody goes home and tells their family how amazing the rock mechanics session was, but they do go home and tell them how much fun they had That's when right. they were at the conference. So. And, and, and it's, it's talking with the people, the interpersonal re relations. Naturally, I like to present a paper and those things, but uh, it's the personal That's great, and we love having you there every year. Not too long ago, and we'll put a link to this below this video too, we featured you in one of our Geo Legends videos and Don DeGroote interviewed you and it was, it was a lot of fun. We always go out and get tons of photos for those so that we can put them before and after and during the interview in some cases. You sent us a photo that had you in a racing helmet. <laughs> and when we went through these, that was the one uh, that we just absolutely loved on the staff. And I thought... I forgot to go back to you and ask what the story was. So now we have this opportunity. I have to ask you, what is the story behind that photo with you in the racing helmet? Well, well, it, it, it first, I have to tell you the difference in culture. In Canada, Quebec, when you grow older, especially when you turn the age of 50 or 60, you hide this. You don't have a party. You don't tell anybody. Uh, maybe your, your children <laughs> give you a cake or something or a present. But in Norway, when you turn 50, it's the occasion for all the other people to celebrate you. And they always make these great big parties. So I was director of NGI when I turned 50, <laughs> a long time ago. And I was at work and it, it, I was not forewarned. And there were six employees of NGI who came and kidnapped me. They came <laughs> covered, I could not see their face. They were all, <laughs> each on a motorcycle. <laughs> I'm not a motorcycle person. I'm afraid of motorcycles. And they kidnapped me. I was having a meeting with the director of the Research Council of Norway. Oh, great but, timing. But yeah, <laughs> but no, but he had been warned. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> and they kidnapped me. And um, they put me, fortunately, in a sidecar. There was one motorcycle with a sidecar. And each of the motorcycles had an NGI flag on it. And we went in the streets of Oslo like that. I was so proud <laughs> of NGI. <laughs> And then they took me to a um, place where all the NGI employees were. And then we had a lunch together and party and presents. And it was a lovely day <laughs> for my 50 year olds. That sounds really fun. Yeah, that's I the NGI family. So who, who gets that honor? Does everybody get that when they turn 50? Uh, usually it's only the director. <laughs> 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 but we do celebrate one of the perks, right? We, we, we celebrate the 50 years of all the employees in turn when they turn 50 and when they turn around, they call it a round number. When you turn 30, 40, 50, 60, uh. 70, because you work until 70. And we have a lunch or dinner for the person with the person he wants invited, but limited to maybe 30 or 50 people. But with the, the whole institute, no, usually it's just for the directors. And that's a great story, and I don't know what I expected if you were going to tell me you'd been in the Montreal Grand Prix or something like that. But that's <laughs> so another question that I had to put in here is a question about you uh, receiving the Order of Canada. Um, this is something that, you know, we don't have in the U.S., um, People in the UK have their New Year's awards. They have the Queen's awards. In Canada, you have the, the awards and the honors. We do not have that in the US. So this might be a double opportunity here to explain to the viewers what this is, what it means. And then I wondered, how, has your OC status changed your life in any way since then? Well, well, first, the Order of Canada. I'm an officer of the Order of Canada. It's an honor the bestow on a person for different accomplishments. You can be a war hero or something, or if you're an Olympic swimmer and win a medal and such. And, and I guess I was awarded that because of my work <laughs> abroad right. and my work in Canada. So, the, but to answer your question honestly first, <laughs> honestly, it has not changed my life. But 
it's a very nice decoration to have and to wear on special occasion when if I go and visit the king in Norway or if I do something official in Canada and my family are very proud and it's a nice celebration but most of the time that nice order is in in its box in the box in the drawer because you're not supposed to wear it just any time and my work is the same. My life is my family, NGI, my work, <laughs> the people I, I meet every day. It's uh, so it does it does not change your life. It's just it, yeah. it's an honor you get. Um, and in fact, I think that giving the Terzali lecture changed more my life than the Order of Canada. <laughs> I don't know who's going to listen to this, but. It's an honor that you receive, but you don't do too much with it. Giving the Terzaghi lecture, I think it, it, it kind of made me better known. And then I was asked later on to give the Rankine lecture. And so I think those things influence each other. So I think that's just the reality of life. I was very proud to be a, an officer of the Order of Canada, but uh, it does not change your life. So two follow-up questions, I think. The first one is, I'm positive there must be other civil engineers who have received the Order of Canada. Are you the only geotechnical engineer? No, Nordy Morgenstern has oh, received okay. it. Yeah. And Carrie Rowe has received it. And I must say, I do not have an overview of who has received it, but at least I know But at least a couple received. more. Yes, yes. They, they are well-earned as well, I would say. And the, the other question to follow up on, uh, you mentioned in the Terzaghi lecture there, do you have one experience that you had or something that happened to you that you think would not have happened if you had not been the Terzaghi lecturer? That's a hard one, and I'm throwing you on the spot here. But. Well, at first, giving that big lecture, and I gave it on offshore in those days, in 2001, that was the main area where I worked. I think first it built up my confidence. I, I, lots of, I, get, I repeated it 50, 53 times wow. in different areas of the world, and everybody told me it was a good lecture. <laughs> so it built my confidence for further lecturing. But I am convinced that after that I got the Terzaghi oration, and then the Rankine lecture, and the Carillo lecture this year. I think they look at your CV, oh, she's given the Terzaghi lecture. Maybe she's a candidate for the Rankine lecture. Mm -hmm. I, I am convinced that those things influence each other. So, yes, it helped, it helped my career. So I'm very thankful for having been chosen. <laughs> That's great. We've got two questions left. I don't, I don't know if these are difficult or easy. Sometimes I say, oh, they're too easy ones, and then the person kind of looks at me like I'm insane because they weren't actually that easy to have answers to. So you were director of NGI for quite a while. I, how many years? Over 20 years. Yeah. That's <laughs> but that's the, the NGI directors are last long. Everyone has when, been there 20 years. When you look back at your tenure... Is there anything you would do differently now if your tenure was starting again? <laughs> That's a difficult question, but, um, but it's a fair question. And so I look back and said, what, what was my main aim when I took over as a director in 1991? <laughs> um, and you know, my objective was to maintain, improve if possible, the unique culture, culture NGI have. And NGI, it, you know, I left the United States, unfortunately, when I was on a sabbatical for one year at NGI, and I saw how the people were working in teams, how well the laboratory were run, the interpersonal relationship, the, uh, the family spirit that they had, and how all the work we do is research together with consulting, so it's not dry with just research and it's not routine for just right. consulting. So this special spirit, which we've called an NGI culture, I, that was my aim to maintain. And then there's all the other stuff that you have to earn enough money and et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I was thinking, okay, if I would take over NGI today, <laughs> my aim would be 
the same with respect to keeping this culture, keeping the way we work in teams, keeping how you have complete confidence in your colleague that he will do the job you ask him to do, and how the wheels turn around and then NGI functions well. But then when that is said, everything that I did in 1991 is old fashioned today. I mean, even the way we did the, <laughs> the accounts, you know, there's a completely automatic ways. And then I think the challenge I would have is maintaining this culture we had with the new IT world, which makes everything much less personal. And the fact that we work, nearly every one of us work at least half time from home now. And this is going to stay. I mean, I stay at home when I have something very definite I have to finish and I have to concentrate. And I go in the office when I have to talk to people on one-on-one -on -one or to, to convey a message or, or do a uh, coordinate, start up a project or something. So I think the challenge, at least what I said, most value to was the people and how they would work together and that they would be happy. We used to have a saying that you, 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 will, you will not make so much money that you're unhappy, but you will not be so happy that you don't earn any money. So there's a fine balance into being a unique culture and then still <laughs> making a, a profit every year so that at least your board of director doesn't fire you. <laughs> so I think the human aspect would not change, but the details of every day running right. the NGI would be very different. I think while you were talking, especially about you know how people are in the office half time now or even less, I guess the office has become almost more of a tool than a place you're using it to achieve something very specific whether that's social interaction with people or because you need something to happen centrally there it, it it's kind of amazing how it's so quickly we got out of our habitual day-to-day -day, i'm just going to get in the car and drive over there and yeah but but the, i mean i was very happy to see how flexible we were in a yeah. matter of a month or two it turned around and, and at least for me, it suits, suits me very well. I, I enjoy working at home, but then I also enjoy going to the office and seeing the people. But, but um, as, as I mentioned, I do a lot of risk assessment and that involves <laughs> doing some big panels with lots of paper and such. So when we do that, then we, do, we go to the office and we have lots of fun. But when we finish and write the report, then we do at home because we need yeah. the peace and quiet. Yes. And we, in, in, at least with the new formula of offices where, you know, you don't really have a desk, you go and sit wherever the desk is available and you don't really know who you're sitting with and there may, may be noise and such. It's not as um, efficient, at least. Yeah. I'm never disturbed by noise, but I still see that my eight hour day is too much cut. You're lucky because I will go crazy if there are little things, unless I'm creating the noise. That's what I always oh. tell my wife. If I'm the one making the noise, <laughs> it's okay. If it's coming from somewhere or something else, uh, I don't know. That might impact no, but, my focus. Uh, but I'm lucky. I don't hear the noise. But it's also dangerous because in NGI, <laughs> I work concentrating by the report, and two screens, moving things. And then if the fire alarm sounds, I don't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of an important one. I get one. forgotten in the, in the room. <laughs> so you mentioned earlier in the conversation that you're originally from Quebec. Mm -hmm. Ruin Noranda, which is, I did not realize how far it was from Montreal. I think I thought it was maybe four hours or something oh, like no, that. No. <laughs> it's a lot more than four hours. Oh, we have to drive the whole day. <laughs> And even then. <laughs> so what aspect, I, I think this is true for anybody who comes from a small town, what aspect of Ruin Aranda do you, do you still carry with you to this day? What, what part of it sticks with you and no one can take it out of you, I guess? The, um, the first I will teach you French, Ruin Noranda. I, I can do it, <laughs> but not when I'm doing my English voice. <laughs> so in Ruin Noranda, uh, it's, it's a small mining town. So what I remember 
first, the copper mine was always present, the chimneys coming, and then there were large areas with the slime. And in those days, you know, I, I was born in 48, <laughs> it, it, we did not think so much environments and such. It right. was just a presence there, and it did, that is what provided all the jobs, and we were happy that we had the mine. And, and in, in that area of northern Quebec, towards James Bay, so very far north, um, there's like a mine every second or third kilometers. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a very, very rich country, mineral-wise. So, so I remember that, the chimneys of the mine. Um, but I, I remember the happy days with, uh, I went to school with the Grey Nuns, believe it or not, and then with the Oblate priests. So I had more, a very good Catholic upbringing. <laughs> but they were very good teachers. I was in a, such a small town. I mean, my education was as good or better when I came to Montreal as what the other people who had yeah. gone to school in Montreal. So that was very positive. I remember the snow, the skiing. We were always skiing. I remember the big family. We were always playing outside, not with my parents, not like today. My parents were too busy <laughs> earning money and my mother was having babies. Right. <laughs> but uh, my brothers would organize Olympics all the time, so I, I would always compete with them, so maybe that helped me in my career, <laughs> living with men. Um, it, and it, it was a small town, but it was a friendly town. And Everybody knew everybody, so there were no secrets, so that was fine. But, uh, and I, I was sorry to leave when I had to go to university, I, but um, I left when I was 17. <laughs> Came back for a few summers, but after that I started working. And I know you mentioned in the Geo Legends video that you played hockey as a kid oh, yeah. too. Like I, I think anybody from the northern US or Canada has had some experience playing as a kid. Do you remember what position you played? Oh, absolutely. I was a goalkeeper. I was small, but I was fast, and I was a very good goalkeeper. And um, I played with only the boys. <laughs> just again, a training, just like when I went to engineering school, there were only boys. And uh, when I was 12, no, I think I was 11, uh, puck. There were no masks in those days, right. and no, I had pads on the knees and such, and I had this uh, big hockey stick. But uh, I was not so good at skating as the, man, the boys, so therefore that's why I wasn't the goal. And uh, a puck came in my face <laughs> and took a tooth <laughs> here. My mother ended my career on that day. <laughs> I, think I had a very promising career. <laughs> that's the case with a lot of people. You have an incident like that and your mom's going to stop you cold. Do you still follow hockey at all or no? Oh, I, f I was a fan of National Hockey League for years and years and years. But when I moved to Norway, there was the expansion from six teams to 24 oh, yeah. teams and it became less interesting. But then when I came to Norway, if I wanted to survive, I had to learn another sport and that was Premier League soccer. So now I'm completely converted to, they call it football in Norwegian, but it's soccer, which is my sport. Well, that's great. We made, you made it through all 10 questions. Great job. <laughs> I always tell everybody it's a feat, even though everybody makes it through. It's still a big deal. For our viewers, if you liked what you saw today, and I like to say you're here at the end, so you probably did, click subscribe, click get notifications, and again, we will let you know every single time we post something to the YouTube channel, which is very frequently. We will have one more episode of Director's Cut in this Labor Day Director's Cut Extravaganza. Look for that tomorrow. Suzanne, thanks again for all your answers and for doing this and for making time while you're down here for ISFOG. No, oh, thank you very much for having me. I think we've had a fun conference. It's been a good week. Thanks to everybody who came out with us in Austin and thanks to all our viewers for sticking with us. And we'll see you with a brand new Director's Cut tomorrow.